On the 26th of August, 1941, we utilised all available time for reinforcing our positions. The overextended sector assigned to our division offered numerous landing areas for the enemy, and fortunately our heavy weapons were available to provide blocking and cover fire in the event of an attack. During the night of the 28th of August, we shifted to Kodorov on the Dnieper to reinforce a gun company that occupied a strategically important point on the line. This point commanded the heights of the bank on both sides of the river and was occupied by thinly scattered forces. The village was situated along an unpaved road where two bulkers converged, and isolated primitive dwellings lay scattered along the length of the small valley to the river. From the pack position, our view of the river was obstructed by trees, ragged hedges, and rustic clay cottages with thatched roofs and whitewashed walls. A large, prominent stone building served as a central reference point. Prior to our unexpected and unwelcome presence, it had probably served as the village school. Below a steep embankment less than 100 metres from our position, the river flowed sluggishly to points unknown, and on the eastern edge of the village was a tomato farm. From the edge of the embankment, the wide expanse of the river, which curved its way around small groups of islands, was clearly visible, and the eastern shore was thickly covered with a heavy growth of trees and bushes. A shallow island directly opposite us was covered with thick vegetation, effectively concealing all signs of Soviet presence. Our supporting artillery battery, situated on a commanding terrain feature, was entrenched near a tomato kolkhoz, which controlled a splendid view overlooking the enemy-held territory. The locations of enemy troop concentrations could be discerned through the vertical wisps of smoke rising from many cooking fires. Our artillery remained active and engaged in intermittent shelling in attempts to disrupt the enemy supply routes that lay hidden from our view. Otherwise, the front remained quiet. Shortly after our arrival, we sat in front of one of the huts, and I pulled my harmonica from its customary place in an interior pocket of my tunic. As I began playing folk songs, I was quickly surrounded by a motley collection of civilians who appeared before us like shadows from the surrounding cottages. The melody, unshaven and far from home, brought the audience to life, and they clapped and sang their folk song, Stenka Razin. In their bright scarves, the women and girls nodded to the tune. The old men and boys tapped their feet on the Russian clay to the music played from a German harmonica. After an hour, we received word from the commander of the Panzer Jäger platoon to spread straw in a former storage facility to use as quarters. Disappointed that we would not be quartered in the scattered rows of huts, we reluctantly obeyed. A large number of us felt as though we had entered a trap, for the building had only one entrance and was located in the centre of the village, which offered no clear field of fire in any direction. The very least we would have preferred to bivouac in an open area, to which we were accustomed. Our gun remained limbered to the tractor twenty or thirty metres from us beneath a grove of trees and a sentry was assigned to stand watch near the single door of the barracks. The clear sky brought a cool summer night, and approximately thirty of us settled into the improvised quarters, where we were soon immersed in a deep sleep. Just before dawn we were startled awake by the sudden detonations of hand grenades near our shelter. A burst from a submachine gun hammered against the wooden rear wall of the storage shelter, and the guards sprang through the door into the darkness of the building. The Russians are here! The Russians are here! he screamed. I leapt into my boots, grabbed my equipment and ammunition belt, and scrambled along with Hartmann and several others toward the only exit. True to the discipline of the German Wehrmacht, our first thoughts were to get to the park, and we stumbled toward it through the darkness. I caught a glimpse of a glowing ember arching toward us from the edge of the stream, and immediately recognised the burning fuse of a hand grenade. I instinctively dove behind the tractor, and the grenade detonated harmlessly a second later. The few men who managed to rally in the vicinity of Hartmann's gun at the onset of the surprise attack now opened fire with rifles and machine guns, kneeling behind the tractor or lying prone on the ground. As I pulled two grenades from my belt and tossed them in a wide arc over the tractor to the edge of the stream, Hartmann bounced a third grenade farther into the ravine. As we suppressed the enemy fire, the chatter of Russian submachine guns slackened, 
and we received no more hand grenades from the stream bed. In the interim, more men of the platoon had sprinted from the building and attempted to reach our position. From the direction of the wooden bridge, a new firefight raged approximately 100 metres from us. We suddenly caught a glimpse of the platoon leader dashing past us, screaming, I've been wounded! And he quickly disappeared into the darkness near the storage shed. Taking advantage of the pause in the firing, we unlimbered the pack and began firing into the heavy undergrowth along the stream, from where we could still discern the twinkling muzzle flashes of the Russian weapons. Bullets striking against the shield of our gun were clearly audible, but with several dozen anti-personnel rounds we managed to suppress their fire and the Russians broke off any further attacks. It had all taken place in less than ten minutes. Hartman and I hastened into the storage shed where the lieutenant was lying with a bullet wound through his thigh. Already being bandaged by a medical orderly, the wound was bleeding profusely, although the orderly reported that no artery had been severed and no broken bone was noticeable. We left the two communicators and the lieutenant's driver with him and returned to our platoon. Hartman assumed command of the platoon and ordered Burkhart and me to establish contact with the company headquarters in the village. We cautiously stepped onto the bridge and immediately discerned the lifeless form of a Russian lying several metres from us, the silhouette of his body a stark contrast against the pale wood in the bright moonlight. The enemy had apparently broken off their attack and retreated, and within a few minutes we had made our way to the company headquarters, located in a farmhouse. The headquarters was filled with wounded, tended by a medical Feldwebel. Here we were told that at the time of the attack on our quarters, the Russians had simultaneously launched an attack against another unit quartered in the east end of the village. We made our report, and to our relief, we were immediately dismissed to return to the more familiar surroundings of our platoon. After returning from the company headquarters, we transferred the puck to a more advantageous position, about 50 metres from the warehouse. From this location, we could cover an area extending from the top of the ravine to the bridge and would be able to take any further attacks under direct fire. We kept the ravine and the slopes to the right and left of us under close observation, but we detected no further enemy movement and received no further fire. There were reports circulating that the Russian attack had been repulsed and that the lieutenant had received a Heimatschuss. We had just begun to feel secure in our new environment, when suddenly, in the growing light of dawn, I observed to our left a small group of Russians pulling a heavy MG over a rise behind the schoolhouse. We scrambled to our assigned defensive positions and immediately opened fire on them with armour-piercing and high-explosive rounds, our anti-personnel ammunition having been expended. They dove for cover, leaving several dead and wounded on open ground. We fired into the location where they remained under concealment and into the abandoned schoolhouse to prevent them from establishing a machine gun position. After several shots, we observed several Russians retreating rapidly toward their rear, followed by the rapid hammering of our MG-34. Suddenly, the air directly before us exploded with small arms fire. From a close range, we came under fire from infiltrating Soviets, and the shouts of the Ivans were clearly audible from the cover of the ravine. Through thick bushes, trees and small gardens of sunflowers, tomatoes and bean plants, the enemy again worked their way forward to our position, tossing hand grenades through the air that rolled to within ten paces from our gun before exploding. We frantically pulled the last case of 37mm ammunition from our tractor, as the gun loaders shoveled and kicked a pile of expended shell casings away in an effort to clear the gun area. We had only 30 rounds of armour-piercing ammunition remaining, and as I stripped the last clip of rifle ammunition into the magazine of my carbine, a quick check with the others revealed that they had expended theirs as well. Hartman had only a half-magazine of ammunition for his submachine gun remaining. The Russians attempted to push across the road to reach the storage building, and it was clear to all of us that we had to prevent them from reaching their objective at all costs to avoid being isolated from the remainder of the company, which would mean inevitable annihilation or surrender. At approximately 1,000, the last anti-tank round was fired from the smoking barrel of our pack. In attempts to deny us the use of our gun tractor, the Russians now assaulted the building directly, and soon it had been set ablaze by either tracer fire or Molotov cocktails. 
Unable to know if there had been enough time for an evacuation of the barracks, we could only hope that the wounded officer had been taken to safety. As we expended the last rounds of ammunition, I removed the bolt from the breech of the pack and tossed it into the undergrowth before joining Hartman in crawling through one of the ravines leading toward the west. At times crawling on our stomachs through the underbrush and then scrambling from cover to cover, we were eventually able to reach an excavated cave cut deep into the clay of the ravine. There we discovered a number of the village inhabitants, peering fearfully toward the sound of the fighting with anxious faces. Obviously the village had been previously warned of the pending attack, and the villagers had crept into the hole to wait out the battle. Ignoring the presence of the terrified civilians, we scrambled to the crest of the ravine. From this higher observation point, we could see the Russians swarming around the storage shed some 300 metres distant. From behind a tree, I took careful aim and squeezed off several shots with my carbine at the figures, and Hartman suddenly shouted that relief was en route. An infantry company, and part of the now dispersed unit that had been positioned next to us, had assembled on the western side of the village. Hartman and I wound our way through the underbrush down to the road and we observed our company commander careening into the village in his sidecar. Russian artillery rounds could be heard impacting far behind us. Our own heavy weapons took the embankments of the Dnieper under fire to block a Russian retreat, and our attacking companies pushed forward. Hardly thirty minutes had passed when, after searching the area, I was able to slide the bolt back into the breech of our gun, and within several hours the enemy had been thrown back into the river through counterattacks. The survivors who were attempting to reach the safety of the east bank with rafts and boats were taken under fire by our artillery. We had repelled an attack by enemy forces four to five times stronger than our own, and we began the search for the wounded lieutenant. Despite a sweep of the entire area, we were unable to locate him, finding only a blood-stained officer's boot in front of the burned-out storage building. During the search for the officer, we came upon a Russian soldier chewing sunflower seeds in the garden of a nearby straw and mud cottage. Offering no resistance, he raised his hands high in surrender and approached us cautiously, glancing about fearfully and waving his open hands slightly as he neared our position. After a cursory search, he was taken to regimental headquarters for interrogation. The following morning, the rifle company reported the discovery of an unidentified body where the stream met the Dnieper. We later learned from the company commander that the body was indeed that of the lieutenant, who had been executed by a shot in the back of the neck, probably by a political commissar. There was no trace of two other missing members of one of the rifle platoons, and most likely they were taken over the Dnieper as prisoners. A Russian medical officer who was later captured after the encirclement at Kiev reported that the German prisoners captured in this area had been executed prior to the Soviet capitulation of that city. We later heard reports that during the night of the attack, the village school teacher and a young communist member, Olga, both of whom on the previous evening had joined us in singing Stenka Razin, had slipped through the Balka under cover of darkness to swim across the wide river. On reaching the Soviet positions, they had provided detailed information to the Russian troops on the east bank, outlining our positions and strength before leading a Russian battalion unnoticed over the river and into the Balka. Our quarters were situated near a bridge that provided a passage over this ravine into the village. The war in the east had begun to exhibit its brutality. Nevertheless, none of us could foresee or comprehend that the bitterness and rage of the Russians following the invasion of their country would grow more intense with each passing year. Much of the civilian population was in opposition to this retribution, especially on the southern sector of the Eastern Front, where we were relatively well regarded. Many of the Russian prisoners captured early during the campaign had expressed a strong desire to fight alongside us against Stalin and the Soviet government. As time passed, the communist leadership abandoned the call to sacrifice oneself for communism and sought to make a strong appeal to the inherent patriotism of the people. To defend Mother Russia against the invading fascist intruders became the patriotic duty for everyone, with absolutely no exceptions. Thus, the conflict evolved into a war of the Russian people against the German aggressors instead of a struggle for survival of the party. 
Unfortunately, the brutal measures of the Soviets could be compared with the conduct of the German occupiers in the rear areas, far behind the front. Through the excesses that took place against the Russian people, the German soldier became, to the simple Russian, a fighter and supporter for a despised, murderous political institution. Because of this doctrine, established and mandated in faraway Berlin, countless atrocities were in turn committed on soldiers in the front lines, even though we front soldiers were unaware of the murder of thousands of innocent people through the Sonderkommandos of the system or of the excesses practised for the pacification of captured areas by our golden pheasants of the National Socialist Party. The commanders of the divisions on the front, as well as many regiment and battalion level commanders, were at that time veterans and participants of World War I, who conducted and fought the war with the undeniable fairness instilled in the officers' corps of the Kaiser's army. It must be added that during the entire campaign in the East, I never experienced a single incident when Russian soldiers who had surrendered were not correctly handled, or when captured enemy wounded were not medically treated exactly as our own. During the attack on Kanev, prisoners were simply sent to the rear unguarded, as every available man was desperately needed at the front. However, I maintain the belief that from the masses of prisoners sent to the rear in this manner, many communists and Russian patriots used the opportunity to slip into the undergrowth and eventually make contact with the ever-growing bands of partisans. The well-organized partisan units would become an increasing menace to our rear areas. As the war continued, the people came to trust and support the partisans to a great extent, and they were able to find shelter and protection everywhere. Throughout the first half of September, we continued to defend our positions on the banks of the Dnieper as the Soviets attempted to regain the West Bank. On the 14th of September, our first units pushed over the river. Following a reconnaissance on the Dnieper island north of Balika, a successful landing was made and the Soviet defences on the heights of the bank were assaulted. Despite strong enemy resistance, large numbers of prisoners were taken. Two days later, our company followed the foremost units as reserve and landed on the opposite bank. By exploiting the confusion of enemy forces, we successfully established a deep bridgehead that continued to be built up by more forces being pushed over the river into the breach. The German artillery batteries ceaselessly fired on enemy positions on the opposite bank from Kodorov, and simultaneously a line of fire was laid down to the east of the Dnieper tributary near Balika. By nightfall, the advance units had reached the area of Yashniki. On the 17th of September, the reinforced infantry regiment 438 gained further ground against a weak but heavily resisting enemy near Balika and Reshishchev while attempting to make contact with advance elements of another corps along the Yerkovsi Road. The attack objective was reached in the late afternoon following the elimination of pockets of resistance. We continued to press onward, advancing to the vital main route from Kiev to the area of Yerkovsi, thus severing an important Soviet withdrawal route. During the night, we received little rest as we dug into the hard earth to reinforce our line. We sweated and toiled in the damp air until dawn, as the constant rumbling of motor vehicles and the clattering of armour drifted toward us from the enemy positions. Throughout the day on the 18th of September, we continued to strengthen our positions, although the enemy line had become quiet with little movement detected. As dusk approached, we felt secure in the knowledge that the Soviet forces had withdrawn farther to the east, leaving only a rear guard to slow our advance. The night suddenly exploded with impacting artillery rounds, and along the rogosov pereyaslav road in the northwest area of Yerkovsi, eleven enemy attacks were repulsed between the hours of 22 o'clock and 2 o'clock. The sunrise bore witness to the effectiveness of our defence, as countless bodies clad in khaki brown could be seen lying in heaps before our positions. Burning vehicles littered the landscape, sending plumes of oily black smoke skyward. We received reports that a number of motorised enemy units had been completely destroyed, and the regimental staff proudly released to us a list of captured equipment, 16 heavy and light MG, 8 heavy artillery pieces, 9 trucks, 2 medical vehicles, 2 fuel vehicles, and 6 ammunition carriers. 400 prisoners were taken, the number increasing to 800 by the 19th of September. 
a number of detachments from Infantry Regiment 436, which had been assigned to clear remaining enemy forces from the East Bank, had also reached their objectives with only light casualties. During the next few days, we brought in more than 1,000 prisoners while combing the banks of the Dnieper. Convinced that the Soviet Union had lost the war, deserters were stealing boats and crossing the Dnieper in large numbers under cover of darkness in attempts to distance themselves from the Soviet army. The sight of ragged individuals either alone or in small groups approaching our positions with upraised arms became commonplace and our confidence continued to mount that the war would be over before the first frost. On the 23rd of September, our battalion was attacked by Russian infantry in surprising strength. We were able to repel the assault with light casualties, and the enemy was thrown back, leaving some light field guns and many infantry weapons littering the ground before us. We remained in our positions until word was received that the opposite bank of the Dnieper was clear of enemy forces and that our division was to be pulled out of this sector. With the end of the fighting to the south and southeast of Kiev, the mounting casualties among our own forces were calculated. Each company had suffered an average casualty rate of 15 to 20 percent, and a rifle company of Infantry Regiment 437 had in the previous two months suffered an average of four dead, two missing, 14 wounded and two sick. A total of 22 men. The strength of our anti-tank company prior to operations had been between 100 and 120 men. The equipment and weapons remained in relatively good condition, and the importance of properly maintaining all military property, as was constantly drilled into us during our basic training, had produced results. The official lines of supply and material between the troops and company headquarters became very informal as the troops learned to live from the land and from captured enemy resources. With the beginning of the rain and mud season, the frontline units quickly learned that the native Russian pony carts were more reliable than the heavy horse-drawn wagons of our own army, which were designed for paved roads. The Russian pannier wagons were used in ever-increasing numbers from captured equipment, or, contrary to strict regulations, occasionally requisitioned from the civilians without authorization. Our 14th Panzer Jäger Company had lost two Chenillet Prime movers to landmines, and others suffered damage to and wear on motors and tracks. Despite the efforts of our engineers, spare parts became unobtainable, although we searched a distance of up to 100 kilometres throughout the army and corps rear areas. The troops had become masters at fending for themselves. From the end of August and the beginning of September, the company attempted to make captured trucks usable. From the vast quantities of captured enemy material left behind by the retreating enemy, especially in the battlefield area of Kanev, our troops were able to assemble a large quantity of serviceable vehicles. The company commander brought in an entire fuel truck, which greatly augmented our inventory of black or unofficial fuel supplies. The Russians possessed large numbers of robust Ford heavy trucks, as well as those of CIS manufacture. Those two types seemed to make up the entire inventory of trucks possessed by the enemy, and we always chose the American-manufactured Ford whenever possible, as many replacement parts seemed to be always available. Due to this method of salvage and use, our army appeared to consist of vehicles of every type and description from half of Europe, sometimes making it impossible to obtain even the most simple replacement parts we found ourselves growing envious of the uncomplicated Russian supply system. Although their inventory of weapons and equipment might not have been as varied or as specialised as our own, what they did have was reliable and could be logistically supported almost anywhere. As in all armies, one of the main topics of discussion was the quality and availability of food. Our company field kitchen was able to work wonders as long as the lines of supply were capable of delivering essential items. During one of my visits to the field kitchen, the company cook proudly showed me a cave where hundreds of sausages and smoked meats hung from long poles. I presented the cook with a number of captured Soviet medals and pistols as gifts for the kitchen personnel, and thereafter we were always guaranteed something more substantial than simply what the official system could provide for us. On 25 and the 26th of September, the main body of the division departed the former combat area on the west bank of the Dnieper, 
Once again, long grey columns wound their way over undulating terrain on the march toward the south. The enemy forces, which had opposed us with tenacity in the previous weeks, had seemingly evaporated before our advance. Throughout the month of October, the division advanced through a Ukraine bedecked with the splendours of fall. The crops had been harvested, tall haystacks and threshing machines dotted the landscape, creating a picture reminiscent of America. We marched in the direction of Kremenchuk, which conveyed to us the message that the city of Odessa on the Black Sea was still under siege. Rumours raced throughout the ranks that we and Romanian units had been assigned to capture it. On the 17th of October, we learned that Odessa had fallen. The division wheeled toward the southeast and was assigned the objective of Nikolaev. While en route, we passed through an area of ethnic German settlements that had been established under the direction of Catherine the Great of Russia some 200 years ago, and here we clearly recognised places named after Karlsruhe, Worms, Speyer, Helenental, and other cities from our homeland. We encountered only women, children and a few old men, as the Soviets had deported all men of military age. In a simple but clean and strongly built stone house, I located living quarters with a bedroom that could have been seen somewhere in the Falz 200 years ago. A wide wooden bed covered with colourful pillows and topped with a large canopy stood inside. The farm women were speaking a dialect that is similar to what one hears in the Falz today. Helping ourselves to fresh milk and white bread, we made ourselves totally at ease in these surroundings. Several days later, we crossed the River Bug on a winding pontoon bridge that strained against the current and entered the harbour city of Nikolaev. Together with the company commander and some other men, I had the opportunity to see half-completed armoured cruisers of about 1,000 tonnes lying in the dry docks. The march continued toward our new objective of Cherson. On the 25th of October, we again crossed the mighty Dnieper, whose waters had drained us of sweat and blood some 100 kilometres farther to the north. It was clear that the southern army elements had advanced ahead along the Sea of Asov and were now proceeding toward Rostov, and that we were to link up with them as reinforcement. We soon found ourselves approaching the western outskirts of a forbidding, desolate area known as the Nogai Steppe. After heavy fighting from 26 to the 28th of October, the divisions of the 11th Army had broken through the narrow corridor of Perikop and had thus cleared the way for us to advance into the Crimean Peninsula. As part of Oberkommando des Heeres, OKH Reserve, the 132 Infantry Division became assigned to von Manstein's army. In breaking through the narrow corridor, it had been possible to employ only limited forces. However, it was now necessary to reinforce the army for a further push into and occupation of the peninsula. As we advanced over the graves of the Tatars, the ancient protectors of the Crimea from northern invaders, we entered a new battlefield. Our division, together with the 50th Infantry Division attached to the Liv Corps, was assigned to pursue the enemy relentlessly toward Bakhtshisarai Sevastopol. It was also necessary simultaneously to sever the road to Sevastopol. The forward elements of the motorised units assembled in preparation for the attack. On the 31st of October, the enemy exhibited signs of full retreat. The advance elements thrust rapidly toward the south in long columns, leaving the horse-drawn units to advance more slowly toward the front. At Kara Namak, the horses of both an entire infantry and artillery regiment were compelled to drink from a single well, other water sources having been poisoned by the retreating Soviets. The vast numbers of wagons and livestock clustered together left an impression of another time, of invading armies from another century sweeping across the steppe. Our growing sensation of becoming further isolated from the Western world shadowed us into the Crimea. We experienced a severe shortage of water, and the few deeply dug wells and cisterns not poisoned by the retreating enemy contained brackish water that varied from bad-tasting to undrinkable. The horses and soldiers had developed an unquenchable thirst as they laboured in the tormenting heat, and the shortage of water for the horses became so critical that even the strongest and most healthy had to be rotated in the harness often. The company mess attempted to make coffee from the brackish water, and sweetening it with saccharin resulted in a horrible-tasting broth that could be consumed only with the greatest amount of willpower. 
The range of march for the rifle companies and horse-drawn units now averaged 50 to 60 kilometres per day. The motorised reconnaissance and Panzerjäger units were able to make much better time and quickly reached the Alma Valley. Running through the Crimean Peninsula in an easterly direction toward the Black Sea are three large valley ranges, the Alma, Katcha and Belbek. The northern part of the peninsula is a vast salt steppe. Long basins for salt production were located here where the water from the Sivash could be easily evaporated, leaving precious salt lining the basins, which was rare and difficult to obtain in many other regions of Russia. During our advance through the Ukraine, we had noted how salt was used as a source of trade among the inhabitants, and it was more valued here than in our own homeland. Demonstrating to us the high value placed on this precious commodity, peasant women presented us with platters of salt and bread as an offering of welcome as we passed through villages. The central Crimea is a flat, nearly treeless plain that nevertheless is fertile and well-tended. Here, as throughout the entire Soviet Empire, the farms had been placed under control of the collectives, the Kolkhoz establishment. In the winter months, snow and ice storms sweep over the region from the eastern Ukraine. The Yaila Mountains lie in the south. They rise steeply from the level centre to a height of 2,000 metres and then fall sharply into the Black Sea on the southern coast. These mountains are thickly wooded and the valleys running to the north bear heavy vegetation. Fruit plantations are seen here, along with the picturesque villages of the Tartars. We soon advanced to a battlefield whose name was destined to haunt us for many months, Sevastopol. We closed upon its north and northeastern fortresses during the next few days. During the first days of November, we experienced little enemy contact. However, the advanced artillery batteries continued to lay a line of fire on our exposed west flank. On the 2nd of November, detachments from infantry regiments, 436 and 437, departed the assembly area in the settlement of Chanishkoy, and soon met strong resistance in the early morning hours. Despite enemy pressure from the left, we advanced in the direction of Adshi Bulat and pushed through the enemy defences to open the advance route. With the gathering of darkness, the strong enemy pressure on our left flank became more apparent and the enemy concentrations were dispersed only by heavy artillery fire. It was rumoured that due to personnel shortages, Russian volunteers from the prisoner of war camps were being used to augment artillery crews. During the night, breakthrough attempts continued to be made by Soviet naval infantry units, and the attacks broke upon our strong defences as the desperate Soviets attempted to push through our lines towards Sevastopol and to the coast. In order to protect the open west flank and to silence an enemy shore battery on the Black Sea coast that hindered the advance of the division, units from Infantry Regiment 438 assaulted toward the west and southwest. A small advance unit later was able to reach a decoy position of this battery, where they found wooden artillery barrels pointing menacingly but impotently toward the sky. The Russians were able to conceal the true position of the heavy battery which was located farther south near Nikolaev. With the onset of darkness, we were successful in taking the outerlying positions of the coastal guns after fierce fighting. An enemy ship operating on the Black Sea was observed, and our pack took it under fire. During the night, the enemy forces abandoned the coastal battery, and the surviving naval units were evacuated from the peninsula in boats to be taken on board the large Soviet ships lying off the coast. Lieutenant Deal from 2 Battalion, Infantry Regiment 438, along with 20 other comrades, met a soldier's death during this operation. It became obvious to us that the Russians held absolute control of the Black Sea, as Soviet warships could be seen silhouetted against the horizon as they cruised freely beyond the reach of our guns. During the previous day's fighting, the Russian Air Force had been seen in enormous numbers, However, Mulder's fighter wing soon swept the sky clear of enemy planes. On the 3rd of November, the advance section of my regiment, consisting of units from the motorised 14th Infantry Panzer Jäger Company and the 9th Bicycle Company, advanced upon a small Tartar village southwest of Evelscheich at midday, where we discovered an abandoned magazine containing Russian supplies, including numerous cases of Papyrossi cigarettes. The advance continued along the Katsha Valley. 
In the rays of a setting sun, the landscape appeared strikingly beautiful, with a narrow road running along a row of poplar trees and between fruit farms. From a distance of about 1,500 metres, we could observe attractive small tartar houses, with wooden porches and low roofs sprinkled among the valleys and along crests of the hills. As we approached the edge of the settlement, the point element came under strong enemy fire, and I immediately opened fire with my pack on a yet unseen enemy in and among the houses. Under cover fire from our gun, the officer in charge of the 9th Company moved forward. Small arms fire began to slam into the house wall behind us, leaving whirling clouds of dust as the bullets pockmarked the mud-coloured buildings near our gun position. Our company commander continued to stand unshaken through the chaos, ignoring the rounds striking the wall behind him, while we lay flat or cowered behind the steel shield of the pack. Through the deafening explosions of the hammering machine guns, I could hear the high-pitched screaming of a wounded soldier, and someone began shouting, Stomach wound! The nearest machine gun fired almost continually, as the gunner emptied the barrel at swiftly moving targets. We continued to concentrate upon loading and firing at the distant figures scrambling between the houses, and the machine gun followed the enemy movements. We attempted to give the impression that we were here in regimental force, and not just a weak advance element with only a rifle company and two anti-tank guns. The ruse was successful, and we observed a number of Soviet soldiers, dressed in flowing dark blue navy overcoats, withdrawing along the valley floor toward the west to the sea. The wounded lancer was lying a few steps behind us on the edge of the road, his upturned helmet a few feet beyond where he lay. A medical assistant knelt alongside him and unbuttoned his dust-caked tunic to bandage the wound. Within seconds, the soldier's screams for help had become unintelligible mumbles as he lay in the dirt. His feverish eyes appeared wide with astonishment against his chalk-white face, and he stared forward into blackness as the shadow of death quickly settled upon him. The medic removed the watch from the soldier's lifeless arm and quickly began gathering personal effects from within the pockets of the ragged, blood-caked uniform. We turned away and busied ourselves with our own thoughts and responsibilities. The thoughts of those gathered nearby remained deeply personal, and one could not escape feeling an intense pity for our brother in the grey tunic who had been struck. Yet with these thoughts, each man turned to concentrate upon himself, about how he could be the next to fall, the next to meet his destiny in Russia. We became at times possessed by these thoughts, as helpless against them as against the death that had quickly enveloped our brother soldier. Thus began the realisation that we were being consumed by this foreign land. One would hesitate and attempt to suppress these thoughts deep within oneself. During the fighting, these suppressed emotions became entangled with every nerve and were strained to the breaking point through the repeated experience of indescribable terror. The cure for the turmoil within oneself was offered to us only in forms of action, in helping the wounded in every way possible, or in the wielding of weapons and equipment of war, the firing on the enemy. The infantrymen became consumed with a remorseless, ever-increasing rage, and the fevered minds could concentrate only on revenging fallen comrades, to kill the enemy and to destroy. The highest degrees of rage would grow to suicidal levels, so near together lie fear and courage. During hours of calm, we would sometimes discuss the impact on our lives of living with daily deprivation and danger, and the general consensus reached was that simple men of robust nature often dealt with the situation more effectively, with less personal stress, than do men who are usually considered to be intelligent or sensitive. There exist, however, no rules to guide this philosophy, and it remains inherent upon the momentary situation which never duplicates itself as every situation in war is different, and the constitution of the fighter changes with time and experience as well. It is often said that one becomes accustomed to it. One may become accustomed to the threat or constant presence of death. However, throughout the long years of the Russian campaign, helplessly witnessing the badly wounded soldiers in their agony always profoundly affected me, far more than when a comrade met an immediate and painless death. He had met his death and was gone, but the cries of the wounded, of our own as well as those of the enemy lying alone between the lines, are often heard long after the guns are silent. In the dim light of an early November sunrise, I sat on the gun carriage of the pack on guard duty, 
when suddenly the crack of rifle shots and bursts of submachine gun fire exploded from very close range, the shots flying over and behind me. I sprang from the carriage and spun around to see a large number of Russians, no more than fifty paces behind my position, moving quickly among the fruit trees. I was immediately engulfed by an ice-cold sensation as I realised our small unit was cut off from our company. Throwing myself to the ground between the gun limbers, I nervously pulled the stock of my carbine to my cheek, took aim at one of the shadowy figures and squeezed the trigger. The light rifle recoiled with the shot and the paralysing fear immediately melted from me. As I worked another round into the chamber of the bolt-action carbine, our machine gun crew, alerted by the burst of gunfire, scrambled to their gun and frantically swung the cone-shaped muzzle to our rear. Within seconds they were raking the undergrowth among the trees with a sweeping enfilade. My pack crew tumbled from beneath the shelter quarters and raced to my position at the gun. However, it was impossible for us to bring the gun into action without endangering our own forces by the direct fire. The Russians had succeeded in filtering between us and the Tartar houses, where the troops of the 9th and 14th companies were quartered, and we could see the company troops storming from the houses in the distance as they were alerted by the racing gunfire. A firefight quickly developed among the fruit groves as the Soviets brought a withering fire to bear on our position, and they in turn were taken under fire from our main body of troops. As our forces brought heavier fire on the enemy from both directions, the enemy assault unit was effectively destroyed, and those Soviets not killed by the hail of gunfire were taken prisoner. Prisoner interrogations revealed that the enemy force was part of the unit that had attempted to reach the coast through our lines during the previous day. The prisoners were clothed in navy blue uniforms, which appeared to be recently issued and were still immaculately clean. The prisoners stated that they were members of an elite naval infantry unit, and we were impressed by the enormous amount of firepower that had been produced by such a small group of men. All were equipped with semi-automatic rifles or short-barreled submachine guns that were capable of firing 72 rounds from drum magazines. I took one of the submachine guns and several drum magazines from one of the prisoners for my own use, as I no longer placed much faith in the slow-firing 98K carbine for close combat. I felt more confident equipped with the high-capacity automatic weapon, and it was to remain with me for many months. Along a narrow road, an ancient stone wall bordered by a vegetable garden ran between the scattered dwellings, and we knocked stones from the wall to create firing apertures facing our front. Behind our position we constructed a barricade from the loose stones as protection from enemy mortar and artillery fire directed on our line. In our sector we remained fortunate, as the high explosive rounds continued to impact at a distance behind us. As we laboured to reinforce our fire position, we were again interrupted by an enemy counterattack. The Soviet naval infantry had crept through the thick undergrowth among the trees to within close range of us, and suddenly silent figures clothed in blue-black rose before us like fleeting shadows in the dawn. The machine gun again exploded into action, accompanied by the barking of our mortars farther behind our line followed seconds later by the impacting rounds tossing clouds of earth skyward some 150 paces from our position. The enemy advance ground to a halt, and they again evaporated into the undergrowth, leaving their dead and dying behind. While sweeping the area we came upon an unwounded Russian, who had become disoriented lying behind a ragged tree stump 50 metres from our gun position, with Stoy, Rukivak, and Idisuda. Halt, hands up and come here. I ordered him to advance toward our position. He stumbled forward with his hands held high, a good-natured grin on his face. We removed two hand grenades and a full drum of ammunition from his belt, and a messenger escorted him to our company headquarters. The ever-present harassing mortar fire continued to haunt our daily lives, with sporadic explosions erupting within our lines without warning. On one occasion, while searching the terrain features opposite us through field glasses, our company commander suddenly stumbled backward, his arms folded across his chest with both lacerated hands held high, blood spurting from open wounds and pouring over his sleeves. A razor-sharp mortar fragment had sliced through the glasses and cleanly severed some of the fingers from both hands. Other than the injuries to his hands he escaped unhurt, and his communicator accompanied him to the field hospital. 
On the 5th of November, the division was assigned to take the Belbek Valley near Duvankoy, Gadshikoy, and Bayuk Otakoy. The objective was reached that evening, and the assaults that followed during the next two days took the form of an arrow shaped advance that captured a large expanse of outer defences and field positions to the northeast of Fortress Sevastopol. The heights near Mackensia, the town itself, and the commanding terrain feature identified as Hill 363.5, were captured and held through heavy fighting. On the late afternoon of the 7th of November, the regiment ordered our guns to be emplaced on the defence line on the western perimeter of Mackensia. Shortly thereafter, one of the company packs destroyed an enemy tank during a Soviet counterattack. Our tractor bounced over the rough-cut road en route to our new destination, the western range of the Yaila Mountains. The high plateau lying before us was thick with forests and undergrowth, and as we observed them from a distance, the gently rising hills and shallow valleys from where we had just advanced gave the appearance of a smooth green and brown carpet. We were provided with a splendid view of the fields surrounding Bakhtchisarai, and the rugged white limestone cliffs to the south were bathed in a soft pink glow against the setting sun. It depicted a serene environment, However, the sound of war resounded from our batteries on the heights, and in return enemy shells burst sharply on the plateau of Mackenzie. About twenty paces from the trail we came upon a massive concrete embrasure, from which protruded the muzzle of a Soviet rapid-fire cannon, its steel glacis plate rising abruptly in the evening sky. Having only been recently abandoned, it was clearly one of the guns that had caused us such misery as it fired upon us days earlier from these commanding heights. Heavy artillery fire soon began bursting on the cliffs, and we sought protection from the white-hot shell fragments in the abandoned bunker. The design of the huge gun was similar to that of our own 88mm flak, although on a larger scale, and on the heavy breech technical information, as well as the calibre and year of manufacture, 1938, were deeply stamped in English. We surmised that it must have been manufactured for use as an English or American naval gun. Moments after we had ducked into the bunker, Hartman drew our attention to our munitions carrier slowly climbing the steep rise behind us, and we prepared for its arrival. Without warning, at a distance of 200 metres, the triple-axle Ford suddenly exploded in raging flames, a plume of black smoke spiralling skyward. The heavy load of ammunition began to detonate with sharp explosions, sending hot shrapnel and intact projectiles raining down on us. The vehicle, obviously having taken a direct hit from a hidden gun that struck the unprotected fuel tank, continued to shower the area with sparks and jagged metal for several hours. After the eruptions subsided, we cautiously approached the vehicle, and eventually the flames died enough to enable us to pull the crumpled and singed corpse of the dead driver from the burning truck. Again with the setting sun came rain. Under dripping shelter quarters hanging from weary shoulders, the gun crews shoveled and hacked a grave into the stony ground for their dead gefreiter. The shallow grave was dug in silence, each member lost in those private thoughts that inevitably haunted us when we lost one of our own. The men tightly gripping the slippery entrenching tools, the shallow grave was dug, the identity tag was removed from the corpse, and his scorched remains were laid to rest wrapped tightly in a rubberized gas sheet. We shoveled earth on the grave and placed his worn and battered helmet on the mound covering him. It was again difficult to imagine that his journey through life had come to an end, leaving only a steel helmet and a tiny mound of earth on a Crimean hillside. The rain intensified washing the soil from the crumbling stones we had piled on his grave. In the darkness they gleamed chalk white, reflecting the light from flares bursting and floating in the distance over Mackensia. The cold rain fell throughout the night, running from helmet's rim into our collars, as we muscled the gun through the thick clay into a defensive position. As dawn began to break against the horizon, we shared hot ersatz coffee with a sentry, manning a machine gun position while he advised us of the strong Soviet counterattacks that had taken place in this sector throughout the previous days. Motivated by his story, we again tore into the earth, digging deeper and piling stones around our gun for protection from the shell splinters. Suddenly and silently, from out of the darkness, poured waves of enemy soldiers. 
Elite troops of the Soviet naval infantry massed toward us, their ranks reinforced with work brigades drafted from the Sevastopol docks and factories. They assaulted our positions from the thick underbrush before Mackensia, pouring toward us in dark waves, hoarse shouts of URA erupting from the oncoming line. Springing to our weapons, we as the attackers had become defenders, and we prepared to defend our positions, step by step, as bitterly as the Russians had done on these same heights several days previously. We opened fire with high explosives point-blank into the rows of attackers. The roar of battle smothered the cries of the Soviets. The frantic loading of our weapons concealed the terror that had enveloped our ranks. The heavy machine gun nearby burned belt after belt of gleaming ammunition through the feed tray, spent cartridges pouring from the hot receiver in an endless stream. Detonating mortar rounds erupted on the stony ground 50 metres before our defences, as our mortar teams behind us attempted to stem the advancing waves falling on us. Slowly the assault broke against our lines. The open ground before us was littered with the dark forms of the dead and dying. Only the cries of the wounded could be heard through the ringing in our ears, caused by the firing of hundreds of weapons in close proximity. The early pre-dawn air remained heavy and almost asphyxiating from bitter cordite fumes. And through the smoke and dust we could vaguely see the forms of wounded enemy soldiers thrashing in agony before our positions. Within minutes we again faced another onslaught, and the sun climbed above the horizon to reveal the full horror of the battlefield. Pushed to hatred and thirst for blood through liberal rations of vodka, the Russians staggered and reeled ahead of the threatening pistols wielded by their commissars, their loud screams of URA again lost in the deafening roar of exploding weapons. Over the din, I heard the machine gunner cry, I can't just keep on killing, as he squeezed the trigger and held it tightly, sending a stream of bullets from the smoking MG barrel into the masses of attackers. Our pack projectiles screamed and tore holes in the collapsing ranks. This attack ground to a halt hardly fifty paces from the muzzle of our gun. We were positioned on a critical height strategically located near Mackensia, and the Red Army was fully aware that if we were permitted to push through to Sevanaya Bay, their lifeline would be severed. Thus, in immeasurable numbers and multiple assault waves, spurred on by threats, coercion and patriotic appeals from political commissars, the Russians threw themselves against us in charging ranks. Motivated by abundant amounts of vodka and facing the angry muzzle of a commissar's pistol for any sign of hesitation, they threw themselves against us again and again. By afternoon we hardly remained conscious as we staggered through air thick with cordite fumes, ears ringing, bodies overcome and exhausted by the exertion and terror of battle. We stumbled weakly over our own legs as we attempted to clear the debris from our gun position. The machine gunners could no longer straighten the fingers of their right hands. The mortar crews could hardly lift their arms from exhaustion. Machine gun barrels, rapidly changed during short pauses between attacks, lay on the ground in dull grey-white piles. Expended shell casings formed glittering heaps and were scattered everywhere underfoot. A heavy silence had fallen on our line. The machine gunner and loader lay collapsed with exhaustion over their gun, staring blankly into the void from where the waves of attackers had come. The pack crew had thrown themselves on the ground, still unable to comprehend the horror of the attack. Behind our lines the sharp clanging of entrenching tools could be faintly heard, as the ringing through our fevered minds slowly subsided. I recalled a story of how some defenders of a fortress during the Middle Ages stacked the dead in rows to be used as emergency defences. Now a comparison came to mind. Dead and wounded Russians lay entangled and thickly scattered before our positions. The heavy underbrush that had protected their advance was shredded and torn by thousands of bullets and shell splinters. With the setting sun, we welcomed the protection of darkness. Throughout the night, the screams of the wounded Russians lying in the no-man's land before our lines continued to haunt us. We strengthened our position and laboured under crates of ammunition. We observed no attempts by the Soviets to recover their wounded, either surreptitiously or under protection of a white flag. Sleep was impossible. Before our battalion sector, hundreds of enemy dead had hurriedly been counted at the risk of drawing sniper fire. Long afterward, I could still hear the words of the machine gunner in my sleep. I just can't keep killing.
Miraculously, my pack crew had suffered no casualties, although the battalion had suffered numerous losses. The Soviet waves had succeeded in penetrating a section of our line before being thrown back in hand-to-hand -hand fighting. That evening, as we drew munitions and rations from headquarters, we found ourselves passing near the field medical station, and now with screams from our own wounded ringing in our ears, we attempted to stumble onward. Through the darkness we followed a pair of stretcher bearers as they wound by shell craters filled with muddy water. We passed rows of our own dead, wrapped in shelter quarters, waiting for their last journey toward the rear on the pony carts. On this night, however, they had to wait before embarking on their final journey with the German army, as the wounded had transport priority. We could see a young staff surgeon bent over an inert form, working endlessly, assisted by medical NCO, sleeves rolled up in the dim light of field lanterns. The shelter quarters hung heavy with rain, stretched over the earthworks filled with wounded, and in the yellow light of a hissing lantern, tetanus and morphine shots were administered. Lung wounds were tightly bandaged, arteries were clamped, limbs were wrapped, and shattered bones were set. Our wounded were laid in rows on piles of straw, evacuation tags hanging from their tunics, in filthy torn uniforms wrapped with blood-soaked bandages. They filled the air with a confusing mixture of screams, groans, whimpers and stony silence as they awaited their journey to an unknown destination. In small groups they were transported to the rear on the pony carts. A bad wound was psychologically shocking to a lancer, regardless of how strong and courageous he may have been, and he would be quickly traumatised by what had smitten him. Overtaken by a feeling of helplessness, he found himself no longer the fighter, but a man at the total mercy of his comrades. Our only thoughts were to flee this nightmare, to escape from this place of filth, misery and death, far away where no shells would fall. We hastened forward and returned to the familiar comfort of our gun, leaving the suffering behind us. This is part two of the memoirs of a Wehrmacht soldier. The continuation of this story will be posted soon. I kindly ask you to subscribe to this channel because your support motivates me to create more videos featuring the valuable memories of soldiers that deserve to be heard. When we reach 10,000 subscribers, I will release a special video as a token of appreciation for your support. Feel free to share your thoughts, memories or opinions on this story in the comments section.